Hello and welcome back to the 15th episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And today we'll talk about energy and momentum. And we will try to figure out what is the relativistic description of these quantities that should be conserved in all types of interactions between objects moving with relativistic speeds. <laughs> Okay, so here's the idea. Imagine a bunch of objects, whatever they are, but each of them having some momentum and some energy. So that the total momentum is the sum of individual momenta, and the total energy of the system is the sum of all the individual energies. Suppose that these objects interact for a while, and perhaps even the number of these objects can change. But whatever happens, we can also compute the total momentum and total energy of the system after that time. And when you compute the difference between those sums and the system of objects was separated from the outside, it was a closed system, then both differences should be equal to zero. But this is not the only requirement that we should impose on the physical quantities that we call momentum and energy. These conditions have to be satisfied not only in one selected frame of reference, but they have to be satisfied in all possible frames in which energies and momenta of our objects are different. And here comes the crucial observation. There is one situation in which we can automatically guarantee that if energy and momentum of our relativistic objects are conserved in one frame of reference, they will be conserved in any other inertial frame of reference. And that happens when energy and momentum are components of a single four vector. Let us see why is it so. You can write our conservation laws with the single four vector equation, so that the sum of all four vectors before the evolution minus the sum of all four vectors after the evolution has to be equal to a zero four vector. But if we now change the frame of reference, that zero four vector transforms itself into another zero four vector. So even if individual momenta and energies of all the objects change, then their overall combination will remain equal to zero. And that's why we'll try to find relativistic expressions for energy and momentum of a particle as components of a four vector, because that will automatically guarantee that if conservation laws are satisfied in one frame of reference, they will also be satisfied in all other frames of reference. So let us consider the simplest possible for a vector that we know of, the for velocity. And let us multiply it by a mass, which will give it appropriate physical units. We will try to figure out whether the components of that for vector are good candidates for the energy of a particle of a mass m and velocity v and its momentum. And before we proceed, let us first check if these expressions have even the right non-relativistic limits. So if you tailor expand our candidate for the energy, we see that it contains a constant term plus something that we are very familiar with, a kinetic energy of a particle and some extra higher order terms that vanish when the velocity is negligible compared to the speed of light. And similarly with the expression for the candidate for momentum, when we tailor expand it, the dominating term is just a non-relativistic momentum. So we can summarize that our candidates for energy and momentum are at least not obviously wrong. To figure out whether our expressions really characterize energy and momentum, we will consider an ideal elastic collision of two identical balls of some mass m. And in non-relativistic physics, an elastic collision is usually defined as such that conserves energy. But since we are not yet sure what energy is in the relativistic context, we will define an elastic collision as such that is time-reversible, which means that if we run our experiments backwards in time, it should also present itself as a valid physical process. So let us consider a frame of reference in which velocities of colliding objects are opposite. And since we have introduced a perfect symmetry between these two objects, after the collision, their velocities will remain opposite. We can also argue that the magnitudes of these velocities will remain the same, because if they have increased during the process, 
Then after reversing the time, these velocities would have to decrease during the collision and that would discriminate one direction of time from the other, which would contradict the time reversibility of an elastic collision. So as we can see, the symmetry requirement determines what are velocities of the objects after the collision, and we can check out if our candidates for energy momentum are conserved in this symmetric process. And they are, since velocities do not change during elastic collisions, total energy is preserved. And since velocities are opposite before and after collision, the total momentum is also preserved. It is way harder to consider a scenario in which the two colliding masses are different, because in this case the symmetry argument does not apply. But one can argue that all matter consists of atoms, identical particles, and when they collide, they always collide in pairs. And in each of these collisions, energy and momentum is conserved. But what about a more challenging scenario of ideally inelastic collision, in which two identical masses merge? into a single resting object doubled in size. If such a process was characterized with non-relative sleep physics, mechanical energy would not be conserved, only momentum would. And this is also what we expect in the context of relativity. So let's have a look at the process in which two identical objects of a mass m collide inelastically and merge into a single object of a mass 2m. In such a process, the total momentum is conserved but the energy is not, which is captured by the fact that our combination of four vectors is not equal to zero, zero. It will have a non-zero energy component. And it seems fine because in non-relativistic physics, mechanical energy is also not conserved in inelastic processes because it's transformed into heat and mechanical distortions. But here's the problem. In this frame of reference, momentum is conserved. But once we change the frame of reference, the Lorentz transformation will transform our resulting four vector and will make the momentum component also non-zero, which means that in that frame of reference, the total momentum will not be conserved. Houston, we have a problem. There is something clearly wrong here, because momentum is conserved in one frame of reference, but not all of them. And to fix that, we have to make energy to be conserved, because it will guarantee conservation of momentum in all frames. But how to do that? Notice that all that we have assumed so far is that the merger of two identical masses m results in a single mass equal to 2m, which is simply conservation of mass. And we have to abandon this. We have to abandon conservation of mass so that energy can be conserved in inelastic collisions, so that momentum can be conserved in our frame of reference. In order to save the conservation of momentum in all frames of reference, we have to give up the conservation of mass. So let's try to figure out what should happen to the colliding masses in order for the energy to be conserved, so that the momentum can also be conserved in all frames of reference. The resulting mass must not be equal to 2m, but 2m multiplied by the Lorentz factor. And this fact, which is a consequence of the requirement for conservation of momentum, has huge implications. It means that energy can be transformed into mass. The increase of mass in this process, let's call it delta m, is the difference between the final mass and the initial mass, 2m. And the amount of energy you have to use in order to create that mass, let's call it delta e, is equal to the difference between the total energy of the particles just before the collision and their initial energy, 2mc squared, which is energy of these objects, before the objects were accelerated to the velocity v. And it follows that the investment of energy, delta e, is equal to the increase of mass, delta m, times c squared. <laughs> Notice that when we Taylor expanded our expression for energy, there was this extra additive term mc squared, which was needed for energy to be a component of a four vector. But now we can see that this term has a very important physical interpretation. It's so-called rest energy that in principle can be transformed into other forms of energy. So unlike in non-relativistic physics in which energy is defined up to an additive constant, in relativity, there exists an absolute scale of energies. So now we can officially wipe out the delta symbols 
and write down the famous relation E equals mc squared, along with relativistic definitions of energy and momentum of a particle of a mass m and velocity v. Knowing that energy and momentum form a four vector will be a very powerful tool. For now, we can use the fact that a square of a four vector is invariant, does not change when we change the frame of reference. So when we compute the square of the energy momentum for a vector, we find that the following relation between energy and momentum takes place in all frames of reference. Also, by inspecting the newly defined notion of energy, we can see that if an object has no mass, but yet carries energy, like a photon for example, that object has to move with the speed of light. Otherwise, its energy would be just zero. Notice that our new expressions also justify why it is not possible to accelerate anything that has a mass beyond the speed of light. That would simply take infinite energy, which is not possible. And so far we have only defined what is the expression for energy and momentum for objects that move with velocities smaller than c. But what about superluminal objects, which always move with the speed larger than c? A slightly more complicated procedure leads to the following expressions for energy and momentum of a particle that has a velocity larger than c, and a corresponding relation between energy and momentum, which seems to indicate that superluminal objects have a negative square mass. It is also impossible to slow them down under the speed of light. These funny objects behave in a way that the slower their velocity, the larger the energy, and therefore it takes infinite amounts of energy to slow them down to the speed of light. I discuss physics of superluminal objects and especially the role of this interesting parameter S appearing in the expressions for energy and momentum in detail in my textbook on relativity called Unusually Special Relativity. So check out the link in the description. And this is all for today. And we also wrap up the first chapter of this course. And next, we run to gravity and non-inertia frames of reference that eventually will lead us to black holes and white holes. So see you next time and...